Hello and welcome to Russians with Attitude. Global war is closer than ever, and we are here to help you understand what's going on from the geopolitical heartland. Prigozhin and Strelkov had a nasty fight online. The fight for Uglidar has begun. A series of aerial strikes were unleashed on Iran. All are important and interesting topics, but our first theme will be a little lesson into Russian history and language. So Imperial Russia was a very hierarchical society. Different terms were used to identify different classes of people. There was a polite address, Sudar for men and Sudarenya for women. If uh, you are massively outranked by someone, you would address him as uh, Vasha Blagorodie or Your Excellency in English. For common folk, there was uh, also a bunch of special terms. A male peasant, for example, would be called Muzik, a female peasant Baba. Basic biological term for two sexes that are universal are Mushina and Zhenshina. So Muzik is a rough, uneducated, uh, hard-working type of Mushina. And Baba is an overworked, uh, constantly pregnant, cleaning and cooking type of женщина. So after revolution of 1917, all the sirs, madams, your highnesses were thrown out the window. Higher classes were dismantled and Soviets started creating new forms of how to address people. That's uh, when they introduced tavarish or comrade. Tavarish is gender-neutral, status-neutral term that was in wide use in factories and basically meant colleague. They try to force people to call themselves colleagues, irregardless of sex, status, but language does not work like that, of course. So people wanted to make a difference between men and women, for example, because most of the people were peasants, they continue to this imperial praxis of calling themselves Muzik and Baba, just like in the old times. And when they wanted to show respect to someone, they would address them with a classic biological term Mushina and Zhenshina. So what's interesting about it all? Well, over the past century, most uh, Russians became urbanized uh, city dwellers. Hierarchy and classes are making a comeback. Yet, uh, those old, respectful forms of address are dead. So, no sudari for men, sudarenya for women. Also, Russians never call themselves uh, sincerely tavarishi or comrades. It was uh, estrachurfed. So, modern Russian people went separate ways. Russian women reject being called baba. In most cases, they perceive it uh, as an insult. Yet men are okay with this lower-class address of Muzik. For example, it's very common of people to say that as a compliment. Putin – настоящий Muzik. For a 19th century person, that would sound like an insult. How can be our national leader be called Muzik, which meant the uncouth peasant? Because the meaning behind Muzik uh, has changed. In 20th century, it became a compliment. With the Russian aristocracy gone, the male role model became very different. A perfect Russian man needs to be tough, resilient, and aggressive. Being overly educated or a nerd was severely punished by your peers in the Soviet times. By the way, that makes us very similar to America once again, because American society also teaches people that uh, being a nerd is the worst uh, thing in the world. Smartest bookworms get wedges, and football players get girls and money. And uh, that's how Russia transformed from a typical European monarchy with aristocrats and peasants into this land of beauty and the beast, of uh, rough, brutal muziks and beautiful devushki or женщины. This piece of information would help you understand the conflict between head of Wagner PMC, Evgeny Prigozhin, and a former Donbass commander, FSB officer, Igor Strelkov. There was a slow-burning conflict between the two. And in the last week, and finally, culminated into a shitstorm. 
Prigozhin made a move and posted an invitation to Strelkov to join Wagner PMC with a bunch of sly remarks like show us what you're made of or uh, you wanted to go to war, then go and prove it. Previously, Strelkov slammed Wagner and called them a shady illegal organization. So naturally, Prigozhin expected Strelkov to refuse his offer. And that's how Prigozhin could strike a big victory against Strelkov, against his reputation, once and for all, because then he would call him a coward. And that's it. So Strelkov knew that refusing this public offer of joining Wagner is a very bad deal for him. But accepting it might get him humiliated or maybe even killed. Strelkov said that he will accept this offer, but it needs to be properly sent to him in paper form via official Wagner envoy. Then he will move to Lugansk and negotiate. Basically a bullshit answer, but it doesn't sound like rejection. People bought even more popcorn and started waiting for Prigozhin's next move in this chess game. And all of a sudden Prigozhin publishes a three-minute audio where he says insults, pussy, a bitch, a traitor, slanders him in all types of way, that he cowardly left Slavyansk back in 2014, and he will send him to the front line, and if he tries to flee, he will piss on his face. Strelkov refused the deal, and... Uh, <laughs> so what do you think about all of that? Well, there are a few more details to consider. First of all, Strelkov has been slandering Wagner, for much longer than a year. He has been slandering them for around six years at this point, saying uh, bad things about their actions in Syria and Africa, and even um, more or less making fun of Wagnerites who were killed in action in Syria back when it happened. Yeah, there is a lot of bad blood between Wagner and uh, Strelkov. Not least of all because of the role Wagner played in Donbass back in 2014. It's not a very well-known role, but that's some very deep lore. Wagner were involved in the fighting. They, um, it was them who captured the Ugansk airport back then. They weren't really a full-on PMC back then, but more like um, just a volunteer unit of uh, retired uh, Spitsnaz officers who came to Donbass to help the rebels. And it's only later that they were really organized into a kind of uh, PMC. And, yeah, and Prigozhin uh, was not as heavily involved in that. It was initially created by Utkin figure. Well, Wagner. Right? The Wagner, probable yeah. Wagner. Call sign Wagner. And they were also involved in some of the... Um, Scheming in Donbass, uh, it's a really a Game of Thrones type thing that was happening. Uh, attempted military coups and uh, governments uh, in the Lugansk Republic doing some shady stuff and a lot of infighting and Wagner played a role in all of that. And yeah, they, uh, many people resent their role in that fighting. Among them Strelkov. And uh, so Strelkov has been talking shit about Wagner for years. And he was also complaining that Putin isn't letting him fight. So he uh, supposedly attempted to go to the front three times already, but each time something didn't work out or whatever. With false identities each time. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> some other guy. <laughs> as and, Gürkin. Yeah. And uh, at one point he basically said that he is ready to go uh, even as a simple infantryman. But then he said that he won't go as a simple infantryman. He wants to be invited to the army and be given a command position because of his status. I think actually a while back it was that uh, uh, Prigozhin already said something that uh, Stilkov is free to join Wagner as a simple soldier. But uh, back then Stilkov said that uh, he doesn't want to go as uh, just a simple grunt, because that's beneath him. And actually, Prigozhin offered him a commanding position. And what he said in his uh, latest uh, insulting voice message, which you mentioned, is that 
every commander in Wagner has to be confirmed by a council of commanders and that Prigozhin is ready to offer him the chance to go in front of the council of commanders. But the council would not like Stilkov and uh, would... There will uh, be a, a, some kind of trial, yes. right? And he will, uh, will have to answer for his uh, traitorous acts in, back in 2014. All of them sound, well... Yes, uh, he, also, he also accused Stilkov of taking money from Which, the... Uh, doesn't Ukraine. sound plausible at all to me. I don't think that Stilkov is motivated by money at all. So that sounds like Wagner have a lot of um, compromise on them and they just project it on the, their enemies. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, I'm sure there was some very shady stuff that would damage Strelkov's reputation if it got out. I'm 100% sure of that because there is this uh, discussion among like people who follow all the Donbass, Navarossia stuff. They laugh getting into, into the details of discussing which of the commanders was like a knight of honor and who was a corrupt warlord as if those are mutually exclusive it's not that black and white it was a very unique situation and in this situation you always get people you don't get people at the top or in leading positions who are like innocent angels and uh, Stilkov yeah. himself is an fsb colonel He's not a simple man. By any, he's not some army officer, some idealistic army yeah. officer. I think Strelkov's uh, idealism and romanticism and uh, all that uh, is also an act, uh, just like Prigozhin's in part, in, in, yeah. in, in part, sure. So, in any case, I think that overall Strelkov has shown himself to be well, not a man of his word, so to speak, in this situation. But Prigozhin has also damaged his own reputation for really no reason. Yeah, it's a lose-lose situation for um, both of them. Basically. I mean, he was okay until that last voice message he put yeah. out. That was just uncalled for and vulgar. And It's also because yeah. of this... Um... Uh, how women rejected the lower class status, but Russian men embraced it. And that's why we have to act a certain type of way, right? Uh, so after this incident, I studied uh, Prigozhin's biography a little bit more closely. Mm -hmm. So as a teenager, he was into skiing, an athlete of sorts. He lived in Leningrad, of course, just like any person of power in <laughs> Moscow today. Uh, when he was 18, he formed a gang uh, that robbed people and flats. Maybe he didn't form it, was just involved. It was uh, like petty stuff, mostly, Gopnik stuff, but uh, on a pretty large scale. So he got imprisoned along with his associates for 12 years in 78. Most of his adult youth was spent behind bars. Inside prison, he also stood out. He was different. He organized basically a business there. Because in every Russian prison, there is uh, some sort of production. Convicts sewing mittens, sweaters, all kind of stuff. So doing some basic work. He was selling some stuff on the side and uh, was quite wealthy by prison standards. For example, a typical convict would uh, ask uh, money from his relatives, whereas Prigozhin was sending money to his mother instead. So basically he was a sort of activist. He was always engaged in that and the other. Uh, he studied microbiology behind bars. So other prisoners did not un really understand him because a true thief in law must not do anything. He must be a total parasite. Uh, but uh, precaution was different. Uh, he was freed in 1990, and from that on, he abstained from petty crime. Opened up a restaurant. A hot dog shop was the first thing he did. He sold hot dogs in oh, the yeah, street. Oh yeah, hot dog shop, then uh, moved up to the restaurant, and using his various Leningrad connections from underworld and normal world, uh, he became Putin's associate and uh, basically Putin's personal catering service. Uh, so Prigozhin is clearly smart and extremely effective in everything he does. 
but culturally from the young age he gathered that a smart man needs to hide his intellect and learn how to pose as a true muzik that's why he probably got into crime as I mean, a 19 year old I mean, Prigozhin is definitely a very smart person but in the end he is just a gopnik from the streets of Leningrad. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's it's what he is. It's not an act, uh, but yeah, it's just part of the Leningrad street culture. And yeah, also he might be partly Jewish, which makes it funnier, but that didn't stop them from uh, being what they were. And also the sports, sports in Soviet Union were uh, very, there was basically two religions, sport and spirit right mm -hmm. in the soviet union and uh, people were free to decide what they wanted whatever J judo sambo skiing box it was like a secret society of sorts because all of them were not just well training for athleticism or uh, their health with um, their partners sportsmeni they were very close and uh, they all respected the teacher they are even called sects in russian sects and a lot of uh, such athletes formed a lot of gangs and not in just in the 90s but since uh, 70s different breed prigozhin and strelkov are two archetypes of a different person strelkov tries to portray himself as an idealist imperial aristocrat he doesn't try to be a muzik he picked a different pre revolutionary model of uh, Vasha Blagorodie, or he at least tries to be. Mm -hmm. But the dirty swines in Kremlin do not recognize his genius and his nobility <laughs> and are not showering him with praise. And that's his basic problem. Yeah. Uh, he uh, plays an aggrieved, constantly offended aristocrat, whereas Prigozhin loves his position as Putin's personal servant. He's acting like this uh, psycho mad dog on purpose. It's part of his muzik persona. So, and Strelkov does not want to serve Putin. He despises everyone who does and associates himself with various weirdos. Strelkov, Strelkov will not go to the war unless uh, he's being offered the position of Ataman Makshal of all intergalactic forces. Yeah, yeah. But both men want Russia to win and uh, to destroy, uh, destroy Ukrainian forces from the map. The war between them will certainly not end. It will get worse, but we'll see. I mean, I assume to a large degree that the only reason why Strelkov is not suffering any consequences for his behavior um, is because of the, let's call it the social contract of modern Russia one that Putin um, introduced, namely that if you're uh, higher up at the FSB, you basically get immunity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That you won't be touched, whatever yeah. you do, unless it's open treason. I think that is a large part of what allows Trukov to lead a quiet life, uh, while at the same time attacking a lot of people in power and uh, saying things that would get other people imprisoned, beat up, or maybe even assassinated. But still, Kov is a colonel at the FSB, and at that level, you just... Uh, it's just the unwritten law in modern Russia uh, that if you belong to this part of the Siloviki case, that you are not to be touched. And that only shows that Prigozhin is not really a mad dog, psycho, but a very extremely loyal servant. And that's why he can't just uh, kill Strelkov, which probably he wants to, to do every single day. But he can't, because, yeah, Putin forbade it. Uh, in the Ukrainian uh, religious pantheon, Putin is the main god, the elder god, but Strelkov is also there. Uh, Ukrainians love Strelkov. They constantly cite uh, whatever he says because it's critical of Russian forces, or Russian advances. Uh, he's like also an evil god, but uh, a double-faced god or something like that. Ukrainians love the guy. I think in general, one of the main points, um, like Strelkov still has a lot of fans. Um, sure. But I think the main thing here is that a lot of people are just stuck in the past. And um, 
There is this romantic image of the Donbas Volnitsa in 2014, of this idealistic people's war that was just done by enthusiasts on the ground, like in this cowboy, Cossack way. To most people in Russia, the current war is not a direct continuation of that war. Because... Yeah. A lot of time has passed since then for the guys who are now fighting on the front lines, who are now 18, 19, 20, half their life has passed since then. And it's just not a big thing for them. The All the lore of uh, the Donbass uprising and so on, they don't care that much about it. They just know that that's when like, the enemy started attacking and that's it. And... Uh, all these intricacies of uh, what Strokov did in Swaviansk and how did he leave and why did he leave and so on. Most people don't care about that anymore. It's a very small percentage of people who were involved in that, in the volunteer movement, the people who were like the ideological backbone of that. And uh, it's maybe, I don't know, if a few thousand people in Russia, who still care that strongly about the, the the old stories, but to most people, it's ancient history. And yeah. uh, people like Strelkov and his loyalists, they just can't let go of it. I mean, I think that most of the attacks against Strelkov are unfair and unjustified, and uh, that uh, there was absolutely no treason involved in what he did. But at some point, even if you say that he was a great heroic figure back then, in the following eight, now nine years by now, he did absolutely nothing. <clears throat> he did nothing except constantly whine, complain, do bizarre political stuff with clowns, with absolutely clownish organizations. Um, he did nothing productive whatsoever in all these years. And right now, Strelkov is a nobody. He is just a guy who complains on the internet. No different from you or me. While Prigozhin has created one of the strongest military assets Russia has at its disposal right now. Like, okay, whatever. In 2014, Prigozhin was still just a shady businessman and Strelkov was a war hero. But right now, Prigozhin has captured Saridar. And what has Strelkov done? It's all complicated. And while, in theory, uh, Strelkov is uh, socially and culturally um, and politically closer to people like me, I can't bring myself to be on his side in his conflict with Prigozhin. Like, uh, I mean, if you go to the most basic level, uh, the one who has killed more enemies right now is the one who is right. Oh, yeah, if you look at it that way, uh, then yes. But yeah, culturally, Prigozhin, it's as if he sincerely hates the gentle, reflective intelligentsia crowd and he tries to alienate them with all that he does. He's not uh, like uh, some retrograde. Uh, he knows the power of the internet. He spends a lot of money uh, for PR, sponsors some funny meme songs. So they just do not care about the old intelligentsia in their live journal blogs. And uh, they deem them extremely ineffective. And Shelkov is this uh, voice of such people. I'm also on neither side. I don't really care who wins this fight. <laughs> uh, all right. So have you heard that uh, the world war has started this morning? Right. Yes. World War Three is upon us. Yeah. Drone attacks uh, target uh, Iranian defense factory as a global tensions rise. So yeah, I woke up and for a half a second, when I no, uh, wasn't really conscious, I really <laughs> believed that because <laughs> Russian Telegram channels uh, started pumping out content with some screenshot of some Arabic media and they badly translated that Israel started a war against Iran, although this proxy war lasts for 40 years and 
on both sides uh, sent a lot of drones and they blow up and uh, it seems like it's more of the same but maybe on this slightly larger scale that happened this morning morning of 29 right yeah so what from what i can tell so far the most realistic uh, thing that happened is that some some or another us israeli or azeri proxy forces used small drones um to do a, a quite ineffective attack basically like there were videos posted of a big fire but apparently that was some other fire from a while ago and has nothing to do with the drone attacks it was presented in uh, like a lot of media not just russian telegram also ukrainian telegram and yeah uh, ukrainians were ecstatic all the, they associate themselves with israel although yes. they are in the position of iran here right <laughs> because um, if israel would actually launch uh, some great operation although i don't really understand how it's possible to do because there is a thousand kilometers between them maybe with the us uh, azerbaijan the avengers but uh... <laughs> there have been rumors at the beginning that uh, the drones were launched from an israeli air base in azerbaijan or something like that hmm, there's so, an israeli base in azerbaijan i don't know iran just has a lot of uh, minorities that can be easily weaponized by its enemies yeah. Like the Kurds and uh, the uh, like, Iran is like ten percent Azeri, if I remember correctly, especially in the north, and uh, which often leads to conflict because Iran supports Armenia in the conflict with Azerbaijan. It does seem like a sort of nothing burger. I mean, it's not especially like unusual for this to happen. Like Israel constantly launches airstrikes in Syria. Israel often blows up stuff in Iran. Um, the Azeris also support their proxies in Iran. The US support their proxies in Iran. And yes, uh, the Americans have been trying to destabilize Iran very strongly last year and it will probably continue but it doesn't seem like anything really big happened of course there's always a chance that uh, i am completely wrong about this and tomorrow uh, world war three will start well, yeah <laughs> we are closer to that than ever but i'm not sure how long it will actually take um, but uh, certainly iran's future seems to me much more turbulent than russian future probably because, yes yeah they have uh, much more internal problems than we do and uh, there is not this catch that you can actually force russians to rebel because well some iranians i'm not an expert but uh, this famous meme of uh, iranian women with wearing skirts and now they're wearing burkas and um, which means that all urbanized modern Iranians uh, by default should hate the Ayatollahs, right? Mm -hmm. The regime. In Russia, there is no such thing. Modern Zoomers with all the memes and gadgets could perfectly assimilate and could perfectly support our government because there is no real ideological war between the two because our government is also full of modern people with gadgets basically yes no... and um and our government doesn't really have an ideology yeah they try to one thing i thought about recently is that mm. um russia is so devoid of uh, so really unideological that um ukrainian and western propaganda had to made up uh, the term racism Oh yeah, which is supposedly the ideology of being Russian, and because Russia is not communist, Russia is not fascist, Russia is not religiously extremist. Uh, the last twenty years, Russia has been basically somewhere between moderately conservative and centrist liberal, and there is just no political extremism or ideolo ideologization of any kind going on. So they had to basically turn the fact of being Russian into an ideology itself. It's kind of like in the Ukrainian Wikipedia, 
the state ideology of the Donetsk People's Republic is described as terrorism. <laughs> with no qualifiers it's, yeah. it's just it's not political it's not fascism it's not communism it's just terrorism they just love blowing stuff up for no reason and uh <laughs> well that might be close to truth because a lot, <laughs> a lot of volunteers uh, you know back in 2014 or even now just want to see <laughs> some explosions and that's their whole ideology <sighs> yeah right Probably we should talk about the latest Russian advances All right, in Ugly the front lines. Yes, so we have a significant movement in two places, basically. First of all, Wagner is continuing to expand um, the area they control around Saridan. Now there is visual confirmation of them uh, taking the settlement Bogadatne which at first was very hard to find because there are like 25 places called Bogadatne in Ukraine. It is located on the road that connects um, Bakhmut and Seversk. And uh, it's now, the road is now not only under fire control, it's now under physical control of Wagner, which uh, is not very good for Seversk. There are still supply routes into Seversk, of course, from Liman and Slavensk, but uh, it's uh, and it's especially like not a very good situation for uh, the Ukrainian garrison in Bakhmut. They have also been continuing attacks on the other side of Bakhmut, on Ivanovske or Krasne. Krasne is the Soviet name and Ivanovske is the modern name, so that can be confusing at times. Um, attacking from Klesheevka. Ivanovske is located on the road between Chesov Yar and Bakhmut. And basically, once Wagner moves uh, a bit south of Pogadatne and takes uh, Paraskavivka and Krasna Gara, which are also suburbs of Bakhmut on the north, there remain only two roads out of Bakhmut. Road to the east? Yes, so basically the direct road to Slavyansk is already under Russian fire control and could realistically in the coming weeks come under physical Russian control. So that would leave only... Um, there are two roads to Chesov Yar, the one at uh, Ivanovske Krasna I just talked about, and the one through Hamova. And basically that road will remain open. And also the small road um, that is south of the M03 highway, which is the direct road between Bakhmut and Slovyansk. There is like a smallish road, kind of a way to go around the M03 highway, but it's not a very big road. Realistically, within a month or so, uh, these two small roads will be the only lifelines of Bakhmut, which is, uh, and they will both be located around three or four kilometers from Russian forward positions. That is not very good for the people who are inside Bakhmut. And yeah, we are probably going to see the end of the battle for Bakhmut sometime in the next, I don't know, four, six weeks, eight weeks maybe. We'll see. It might take a while. It depends on a lot of things. As this the stuff usually does, it's always possible that um, instead of going uh, the Mariupol route, they go the Lysychansk route and just leave. When the situation is about to become untenable, that is also a possibility. By the way, um, Azov guys have announced that the Azov regiment is no longer part of the National Guard of Ukraine and is now an independent assault brigade in the Ukrainian ground forces and will be sent into Bakhmut, which is, I think, very good news. <laughs> um, funnily enough, in Bakhmut there is a cemetery called Mariupol Cemetery. I think it would be a perfect occasion to bury in Bakhmut on the Mariupol Cemetery the people who should have been buried back in Mariupol. So, yeah. Language games, as always. So, so much for Bakhmut. And on the other side, 
we have Ugledar. The Russian assault on Ugledar is continuing. It is extremely heavy fighting. There is very little reliable information coming out. There are no war reporters on the ground from either side, from what I can tell. Uh, we do get a few drone videos, but it's hard to tell anything from them. Most of the drone footage we get from the area is of uh, Ukrainian positions getting pounded really hard and of Russian troops also getting pounded on the advance. South of Ugledar is basically like two kilometers of completely empty and flat steps. And that is a very difficult area to advance through. We are not in 1941 anymore, where a tank division is super happy to be in a step because that's where they're the strongest. Steps are really, really shitty to advance through. We have seen that with the Ukrainian offensive in Kherson Oblast, where they just lost thousands of people and hundreds of vehicles because attacking a step just sucks. And uh, the Russian forces are now faced with the same problem uh, at Ugledar. And uh, yeah, both sides are taking heavy losses. It's an absolute bloodbath, uh, considering how small this area is. Um, it uh, reminds one of the settlement just in front of Ugledar, Pavlovka, which is also a tiny village, but the battle was really extremely heavy and uh, there were a lot of soldiers involved and many people died there and Uglidar is uh, turning out into another bloodbath like that this is not uh, it's not some random village Uglidar is important and that's why the ukrainians are defending it so fiercely and that's why the russians are attacking it so fiercely basically U Uglidar is um, the anchor point of the Ukrainian defensive line, both for southern Donbas and for the Zaporozhye area. Mm, taking Ugledar opens up, would open up a whole bunch of possibilities for the Russian military. Um, because after Ugledar, you the thing about Ugledar is that it's all steps, but Ugledar is uh, on a slight elevation. And it's also full of um, high-rise residential buildings, which have been fortified by the Ukrainian army and used the strong points. So basically, from Ugledar, you can overlook the whole area. You can imagine it, I don't know, like a castle in the plains on a hill, which in medieval times would have been the ideal position for a military fortification. <clears throat> and so Ugledar is very heavily fortified. It has been a fortress on the contact line or near the contact line for many years now. And uh, it will be very hard to take, but after taking it, so much stuff opens up. Like there is nothing between Ugledar and Kurakova. Kurakova is a settlement uh, just west of Marienka. And basically breaking through Ugledar would allow one to encircle Marienka. It would also allow flank strikes into the Zaporozhye area, where Russia has been doing some shaping operations and uh, advancing a few kilometers on the whole front line. Um, it would allow for flanking strikes on Vilika and Vasyolka and Kulai Pole. Whatever, you can just go right into the Ukrainian rear if you feel like it. Um, it's just empty steps there and no fortifications. Because uh, the other settlements are not built like Ugledar uh, on elevations and with those fortified high-rise buildings. And there's also a mine. The, the mine near Ugledar is also extremely heavily fortified. So there are just no such strong defenses beyond Ugledar and um, it will be much easier to advance afterwards. And Actually, there was a Russian offensive for Ugledar and Marinka already in August 2020. Uh, yes, I mean, we almost uh, took Ugledar in March, but uh, it just wasn't strong enough to do it. And uh, the battles for Pavlovka, were also about Ugledar ultimately. And the Ukrainian counterattack back in summer when they retook Pavlovka uh, was also 
um, part of that. Ugledar is also important because if the Ukrainians ever plan on attacking Volnavaka and Mariupol, which uh, is an idea that has been floated by a bunch of people because this is basically the most narrow part of the land corridor to Crimea. Like from Ugledar to the to Mariupol, it's just 70 kilometers and of course just around 75 kilometers to the sea. And some American military analysts and Ukrainians too have brainstormed potential Ukrainian operations and a uh, deep strike from Ugledar directly to Mariupol was one of the options that was considered to be very daring, but could be catastrophic for the Russian army. Taking Ugledar basically makes that impossible forever. It would safeguard the land corridor to Crimea. It also helps with the Donbass railway network and so on. So it is really important strategic position and it makes perfect sense that the ukrainians are defending it so so fiercely if the sides were reversed it would be exactly the same and the fighting will go on for a while it uh, will continue to be an absolute bloodbath the question is now if russia has enough reserves in the area to exploit the breakthrough after uglidar is taken because a lot of stuff will depend on that there will be a lot of possibilities for further advance but that depends on the on how many forces uh, russia has in the area i've heard from sources close to the ground that uh, the ukrainians have already lost more people in uglidar than there were defenders when the assault began that means that we know that the ukrainians threw two brigades two additional brigades into uglidar which means that those are bleeding right now too. For such a tiny operational area, there are a lot of soldiers there. I would estimate probably um, probably around four to 5,000 on each side, which is really a lot for such a tiny area. Yeah, it will continue to be extremely bloody with heavy losses on both sides, heavy losses on the Ukrainian side because they are sitting ducks for Russian artillery and Russian counter-battery fire is giving it 200% um, because the Russian troops have to advance through the steps where they are also sitting ducks for Ukrainian artillery. So it's a very hard fight and uh, I think it will continue for at least another week if everything continues as it is right now. Ironically though, um, Russian losses will probably go down once the fighting becomes like house to house close quarters fighting, which sounds like a paradox, but it is what it is. Russian troops generally are very good at this type of fighting and Ukrainian troops are not. It, it sounds weird, but, but uh, house to house fighting on short distances will be probably safer for the Russian troops than uh, advancing through the steps south of Uklida. I just remembered the funny comment on the latest video. You two guys sound like civilians when you're talking about war. <laughs> As if uh, we ever claimed that we are not civilians. Yeah, I am a civilian. I am, um, my expertise of war is based exclusively on like... Um, RTS games. <laughs> <laughs> no, on uh, academic studies, on internet autism and on knowing many people who know a lot about war <laughs> that's about yeah. it so i never claimed to have actual real like military expertise but um i mean i know a lot about um in particular this war and uh, the first Donbass war and i'm um, a veteran of online syria civil war autism on the image boards and so on so yeah and i'm also always been a voracious study student of military history so yeah in general the battles in the southern Novorossia seem to be much more bloody and in the steppe region chaotic and bloody than in the north and i've seen a couple of russian conspiracy theorists claim that um, 
well, battle for Glidar is uh, so slow. The conquest of Glidar is taking its time because of Khodakovsky, who is a secret Ukrainian spy. Well, mm. he was an actual SBU agent before 2014. And then he uh, turned sides and uh, became a rebel in Donetsk. Yeah, Khodakovsky, there have been a lot of bad rumors about Khodakovsky for years. Um, he was accused of doing shady deals with the Ukrainian side during the battle for Donetsk airport back in the first Donbass war. Um, supposedly he um, was secretly arranging for the Ukrainian troops to get supplies and go on rotation in Donetsk airport. He was accused of uh, similar things in Mariupol because his uh, unit, the unit he commands, was also at Azovstal. Vostok Battalion. Yes. And um, I personally don't have a super strong opinion on Khodakovsky. I think if he was that obvious of a traitor, he wouldn't be where he is right now. Um, and if we go back to 2014, 2015, like I said, it's not black and white and um everyone did constantly uh, like those back deals there were a lot more shady deals back then than now i can assure you of that and even people you would not have expected to have done stuff that could be considered shady or even treason Matarova was also doing unofficial negotiations with the ukrainians um about stuff like that and no one would accuse Matarova of being a traitor. Everyone did that to some degree, um, like Mazgavoy was involved in um, expropriations of stuff and, and most of the infighting was also often about like industrial assets and stuff like that. So it's, it's not all black and white. and. A large degree of that is just bias against those who survived because those who are dead can be idealized and those yeah. who didn't die are real people. Those who have died have turned into legendary images. And so while I understand reservations against Khodakovsky and in part I share them, I would not trust a former SBU agent really. But I don't think that he is uh, actively sabotaging the war in the ways that some Russian conspiracy theorists accuse him of. I think he just don't, even if he wanted to, theoretically, he doesn't have the pull. Because the main force at, in Uglidar are the Russian Marines of the Pacific Fleet and not his guys. Yeah, there was also a lot of talk about the Leopard tanks and Abrams who will be in Ukraine <laughs> this spring, maybe, possibly. So, of course, Ukrainians are rejoicing, they're naming their newborn babies, uh, <laughs> Leopard and uh, Abrams, uh, yeah, the time of Javelin babies and... Uh, Bayraktar babies <laughs> is gone. Now it's all about Abrams babies. So what do you think about... Uh, well, yeah, a lot of people are uh, comparing Leopard stats with uh, like uh, Russian tanks. That makes no sense at all. It makes yeah. no sense at all to compare tanks because there is little to none tank on tank combat in this war. Tanks don't get destroyed by other tanks. Tanks get destroyed by anti-tank weapons. And it's like people, or right now, the Ukrainians want to get F-16s and people are talking about dogfights between F-16s and Su-25s. There will be no dogfights. Planes don't get shot down by other planes, except maybe from like 500 miles away with uh, hypersonic missiles. Um, planes get shot down by anti-air weapons. And... Um, the tanks, um, of course, it is a significant expansion of capabilities for the Ukrainians. Um, like 100 tanks is 100 tanks. It doesn't matter all that much what kind of tank it is, because having tanks is always better than not having tanks. 
that is one of the main lessons of this war, actually. That having 100 uh, tanks, no matter if they're good or bad, is better than having 20 tanks. So there will be severe logistical problems, of course. I mean, it's a fucking nightmare. They, they, they will have like five or six different modifications of the Leopards from different countries. It is likely that the crews, that at least part of the crews will not be Ukrainian, likely Polish, because uh, the Polish military knows how to use Leopards. And uh, yeah, they will probably use them for some kind of offensive if they don't have to throw them into the fight immediately just to um, close up some holes. Uh, that depends. But it will not be like a game changer or anything. Leopards and Abrams are not invincible. And um, especially Abrams will take a while. And uh, just today, the Americans basically admitted that they, like, it might be years before they sent Abrams and they just said uh, that they will send Abrams to get the Germans to send Leopards. And they don't actually plan on sending Abrams immediately. So once again, the Germans got cucked. Leopards, yeah, they're good tanks. They're not bad tanks, but... A Leopard will not survive a direct ATGM hit, neither will a T90M. It will just not be like a huge game changer. The Ukrainians had around 2,000, 2,300 tanks at the beginning of the war, of those around half in active service. So around 1,200 tanks in active service, 1,300, um, the rest in deep storage and probably mostly cannibalized for spare parts right now. And uh, we have direct visual confirmation of, if I remember correctly, around 300, 350 or so destroyed Ukrainian tanks. And I did some back of the envelope mass uh, some time ago and the guys that lost armor, uh, a great website, by the way, for this uh, kind of technical stuff. In the comment section, some guy also did some statistical analysis and uh, basically it's estimated that the Ukrainians have lost around 800 tanks overall. Uh, some of those, of course, can be repaired, but repairing tanks is actually not that easy. It takes a long time and Ukraine doesn't really have the industrial capacity for that anymore because... While they did inherit half of the Soviet tank industry in Kharkiv, they, of course, did nothing with that. And that which survived was bombed by Russia. So I think for serious repairs, they have to get their tanks to Poland. And uh, that all takes a lot of time. It's hard to replenish losses for them. They did get around 300 tanks already. And now they will get like maybe 200 more. So while that does replenish their losses to some degree, uh, to a significant degree, it is simply not that big of a game changer. Yeah, and the Russian businessman will pay a reward of 10 million rubles for each American Abrams tank. They especially focus on Abrams. For Leopards, it's like a safari, yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> but Abrams is very symbolic. Uh, and I think it will cause uh, Russian soldiers to wear more GoPros because how could you prove that yes. you <laughs> destroyed this uh, American or German mm, tank? I actually think that after the war or maybe some years down the line, we will get a lot of GoPro footage from this war because um, Wagner pays soldiers a premium for destroying equipment and especially tanks and stuff like that. So I think many Wagner soldiers are actually fighting with GoPros just so they can prove that they actually destroyed the equipment and uh, can so they can get their bonus money. Are regular soldiers not allowed to do that or what? Or it depends on the... It depends. I mean, r r regular soldiers are not allowed to have phones either, but uh, they do. I see. Like the only ones who strictly enforce the no phones policy is Wagner. 
anyone else it's kind of banned but everyone still uses them on both sides so that means the rewards for every tank that yeah there will be a lot more future uh, content yes and footage in the beginning of the episode i called russia the land of beauty and the beast well it's not or of course totally true but it's uh, one of the stereotypes that are mostly true and uh, if we will talk a bit about us personally do you and uh, your wife uh, look like uh, an beauty and the beast <laughs> because i am starting to transform into a beast for sure <laughs> and to an orc really yes and... i think uh, partly yes as i think in in 15 years it will be more pronounced <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i think it's very true but it is what it is it is our destiny to become orcs so all right thank you for listening and see you very soon i promise to upload a new paywall volunteers episode in the start of february <laughs>